You know, all of us that are parents have this desire as we raise our children up, that our children grow up to be productive members of society, right? I mean, when children are small, the big question is, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And what kind of answers do you hear? A firefighter? What else? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Bricklayer, Bricklayer, yeah. Stonemason. Stonemason. (laughs) Garbage collector, street sweeper. I'd like to grow up to clean washrooms professionally. Um, It's always this this desire, isn't it, in the heart of a parent to to see your children grow up to be a productive member of society. Um, And yet it doesn't always happen that way. I, I was thinking of a customer of mine who uh, he was, my customer's blind. And I was called in to restore this old stone fireplace. And uh, as I got to know him, well, I'd be working and he's, he learned, he was blind from birth, but he learned to play the piano so beautifully. He would sit down at this, it's this beautiful house right on the lake. And he sits down at his grand piano and his fingers. And I'm thinking, wow, is this music coming from him? And he's blind. And then as we talk, he tells me his story. His father was a a very uh, skilled heart surgeon, American, and uh, had this, bought this cottage, set him. So the point is, his father knew that his blind son, whom he loved very much, could never go to medical school and be a heart surgeon like himself. He was wonderfully musically talented, but knew that his son would never make a really good living at his musical talents. So his father worked hard, stored away his wealth, had this house that was their summer cottage, but he gave it to his son when he died. He had this trust fund set up with with a a guy that to to manage that for him. And and he, he was a son that was dependent, but his, his parents were so pleased to live their life to provide for their son, whom they loved so much, because they knew he could not provide for himself. A whole different father-son relationship than, for example, Wayne Gretzky and Mr. Gretzky, his father. I date myself a little bit because he's, that's the hockey hero that comes to my mind, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, I remember him playing in Edmonton and just just magic on the ice, you know. And his father was there. His father who had who had brought him, you know, woke him up early, brought him to all those early morning hockey practices as a, as a little guy, and then watched his son as he blossomed into this amazing hockey player. And there at the at every game there was his father in the stand somewhere cheering on his son. It was the father that would say about his son, that's my boy. That's my son with whom I am well pleased. Look at what he has done with his talents. Wow. But in both cases, both family situations, each father loves their son the same, right? And those of us that are our parents, we we know that each of our children are different. Some have talents to go and take on the world. And others, we're just, well, we don't know. Like some, sometimes as parents, we have a child with special needs that we know will always be a dependent. And you don't love that child any less, maybe more. And you set up and you care for them. And it's a different relationship. Well, I want to take this into into our our conversation today of how God feels about his children. And then from our perspective, what kind of a child do we want to be? Two sides of the picture. When we look at what God has done for us, we see a wonderful story of atonement. And I want to read... Uh, some passages of scripture, and 
Rather than writing these out, I want to use my Bible. I've put lots of bookmarks in here, not to spend too much time turning pages. But I want to read from this wonderful book that God has given to us. And I want to, in this way, stress visually the use of this book for all of us. Because this book is the key point of this message today. When we look at how we have started this father-son relationship, we come to John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus that has come to him. And Nicodemus is saying, we know you're from God. But then God, Jesus answers Nicodemus totally different from how Nicodemus starts a conversation. He answers according to what's in Nicodemus's heart. Because Nicodemus is saying to Jesus, oh, we know you're of God. And Jesus answers him and says, it's not that I'm from God. It's that I want to bring you into God. Nicodemus's mind wasn't even there. But that's what Jesus was saying to him. When he says in verse 3 of chapter 3, most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says to him, what? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the spirit. I want to talk to you today about Being born of water and a spirit. What does that mean? Where does the water have to, where does the water come into this? Many times I've read this and I'm thinking, yeah, a person is born again and they're baptized. So they're born of water and the spirit. And yet, you know, there's a lot more to this. When we're talking about coming into this family relationship where God is our father and we're his son. We're his children. We're born into him. We have to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and go right to 1 Peter, which is back here somewhere. Here we go. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. We read, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver and gold, from your aimless conduct received by traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, if you were Jewish and hearing this, you'd understand because the Old Testament Jewish process of atonement with the lamb. But Jesus himself is the lamb The precious blood of Christ. If we go down to verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So you're born again by the word of God. And Jesus himself is the lamb without blemish. And you know, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when you're born into him, there is a cleansing that happens within your heart. And if we turn to Romans chapter 3. And we look at verses 21, starting at verse 21. But now you see the righteousness of God apart from the law, apart from the law is now revealed, being witnessed in the law, by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness 
Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of one that has faith in Jesus. So we see a picture here. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive, to cleanse. By faith, we come into him and he gives us a righteousness, which is the atonement, the cleansing of his blood. So my question today is, why is there a need for washing with water? If the blood of Jesus cleanses us completely, 100%. Have you ever thought about that? So, as a Christian, I'm cleansed by the blood completely. Completely by faith. So why is there a need for the washing of water? It's like, if I'm born as a little kid into a family... And I see three meals are put on the day. Three meals a day are put on the table in front of me. And my parents buy my clothes. They pay for everything. They buy me a car. They buy me clothes. They take me on vacation with them. So why do I need to get a job? Kids, have you ever thought about that? Uh, What if your parents give you an allowance and a credit card along with the car and clothes? Food. Toys, video games, TV in your room. Why get a job? You could be a dependent your whole life. And your parents, who embrace you and love you, would have loved to have you there with them, that you could take care of them as they grow old, right? As a Christian, we have the atoning Blood of Jesus, totally cleansing us of all of our sins, right? And by faith, we are ushered into an eternity with him, right? So why is there a need for washing with water? Because if we turn to Ephesians, and if we look at... um, Let me just turn back. Ephesians chapter 5. And if we go there. And, you know, the conversation Paul is having is really talking about marriages and stuff. But really, in verse 22 of chapter 5, he says, this is a great mystery about husbands and wives loving each other. It's, it's a great mystery. And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. But, he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So what he's saying back up to verse 25, from 32, back to 25, verse chapter 5, he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. In other words, when you come into Christ, it's like getting married, you get a new name, right? And now you're brought into him. That he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water, By the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So my challenge to all of us today is simply, is it enough For you to be fully atoned for. With heaven as a destiny, as heaven as a present reality. With God listening to my every prayer. And the angels around me serving me. And his Holy Spirit as his personal deposit and guarantee. Is that enough for you as a Christian? Or would you like to be fit into his economy, to be adjusted into his 
like admiration and to be transformed into usefulness for him so that he could say of you like Wayne Gretzky's father would say of his son when he's on the ice, yeah, that's my son. Wow. Where are we at? You know, with atonement, I get a brand new heart. And in a good way, it's all about me, isn't it? I mean, through the atonement of Christ, we find out who we are. Through the atonement of Christ, we find out whose we are. And through the atonement of Christ, we find out where we are. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, it says, For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, but you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This is who we are by the shed blood of Jesus. We are that inhabited be matter. We are humans that Christ incarnates himself into. And this is a beautiful thing. In John 17, as Jesus prays this prayer that is in front of his disciples, I won't read the chapter, but if you look at John chapter 17, how many times Jesus repeats, those that you have given to me. He's referring to his disciples and all who believe on him. Those whom you have given to me. These, these are mine. You have given them to me. I give them to you. And he keeps repeating this theme in this prayer. As, as a blood-bought child of God, we are Christ's. We belong to Jesus. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 6, we find out where we are. In chapter 2, verse 6 of Ephesians, and he has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. Like this but let, let, me, let me set the paradigm for this so, so I'm not uh, confusing you in, in what I'm saying. We are three parts, spirit, soul, and body, right? So in our spirit, this purchase of us, this total righteousness of us, and this placement of us in the heavenlies has totally occurred when Jesus rose from the dead. So step out of time for a minute. And when Jesus ascended to heaven after descending with our sins, all of us were included in him. So that now by faith, when you believe, then you are included in your conscious experience that you are now there. Right? In our spirit. Past tense. But that's not my soul experience. My soul, which is my mind, will, and emotions, my conscious thinking, I'm not there. When I close my eyes, I don't see anything that's not just darkness. I mean, it's my, my consciousness is not there. So within my soul, you have this, this need for washing. But in my spirit, the atoning work of the cross in the blood has totally been accomplished and done. But now in my soul, there is a continuing work of the cross that has to work in my soul. So you see, the same cross is functioning past and present. But then in our body, this, this uh, aging, atrophy-prone body, there is, a, there is a harvest that is future, that's connected to what has happened in the process of the present. Does that make a little more sense? Past, present, future? So that we're not getting confused with an anomaly between atonement and the need for washing. So atonement is that I get a new heart. The washing is what God wants to do with the heart. Does that make sense? It's like if you're a child in a family, you're there, not by choice, but because you were born. None of you kids got to choose what family you were born into. You just opened your eyes and you said, there I am. You may complain, but you don't get a choice. And in the same way, with our spiritual birth, 
we've made a choice to accept him. But now we're there. And nothing that we can do can disqualify us from bearing his name because there was nothing we did to get his name. You understand? There is a way you could deny him. Kids, you could go grow up and you say, I don't want that family name anymore. And you can go to court and you can get a different family name and you can disassociate from everyone that you've ever known in your bloodline. You can if you want. But, no, it'll never be taken away from you. And in the same way, in Christ, we have this, this thing where, okay, I'm there. I have his name. I'm in this church. I'm in his body. But now what? Am I a dependent on his grace? Always taking his atoning work in my life. Always receiving for my mistakes. Um, but where is this sense of production? Where is this sense of, of rising to the admiration of my parents? And getting to the point where I'm actually providing for them. Wow. Imagine as parents, what joy it is when you've worked so hard putting food on the table and clothes on the back and paying the education bills that your children grow up and with such a good employment and job has all this money coming in that they say to you as parents, don't worry, mom, dad, we'll look after you. Is it, wouldn't as a parent, you just feel like, yeah, that's my kids, right? How do you think God feels? This washing is about what he can do for us. Jeremiah 17, 9 as says, explains in very graphic terms uh, one of the problems uh, as a parent looking at his children. Have you ever had an obstinate child, parents, where that child is just, they go contrary to everything you want them to do or say? Well, God has this problem. He says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, I search the heart. I test the mind. This is the aching of a parent. And then in, in Mark, if we turn to Mark chapter 7, and we go to verse 20 to 23, He's saying, you know, from, from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds. Now, this is the heart of a Christian who is fully atoned for, okay? A blood-bought Christian with the Holy Spirit. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So as a Christian, you, there's something in you that comes out. It surprises even you. And you, and you come to the, to the cross for the, for the shed blood of Jesus. And you re, if 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But what does God do with such a heart? What does God do? In Ezekiel, if we turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, it's written in verse 25, then I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a new, give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments, and you will do them. Now, I want to read you something else that relates to that. Matthew 28 is a familiar portion. The Great Commission, when Jesus says, all the authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, go there and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. And then if you compare that, the Ezekiel passage, the Matthew passage, and if you compare that to 
the Ephesians passage where I want to show you something interesting here. So in the Ezekiel passage, it says, walk in my statutes and, and keep my, my judgments. In Matthew 28, it says, teaching them to observe all things. And then in Ephesians, remember we read this, that, that love the church, and you may sanctify her, cleanse her with the washing of water, that he might present her to her, that she may be holy and without blemish. The washing of the word. Do you realize what this is? It's not just letters in the page, but it's what the Holy Spirit uses to wash our souls. To change this heart into something that causes him, our most high God, to look at his corporate son and say, whoa. That's my son with whom I am well pleased. Hebrews chapter 4 it describes this word so, so wonderfully. It says, for the word, okay, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Is that not a sobering thought? We will stand before him giving an account and everything is open And he's looking at the heart. And the question is, God is saying to himself, what do I do with this heart? What do I do with with this heart? Where do I fit you into my economy? As any parent, he says, I want so much. I want to do so much with you. Now, let me see your heart. Let me see where I can fit you in. What is our desire? What kind of a heart do we want to be exhibiting on that day when we stand before Jesus as our judge and we give an account for our lives? When is that day coming? How much time do we have before we stand before him that day and give an offer and his eyes of fire and his mouth with the sword is looking at us? The key, the key is this book. Is yours open? Is your pages well-worn? Do you know your Bible app well, how it functions? The most incredible, if you you need to read, spend some time with Psalm 19. I'm not going to read the whole Psalm. I just underlined some things that I want to quickly go through. Psalm 119, let's start with verse 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Verse 9, how can a, a young man cleanse his way? Young people, you're thinking, being young is tough. Do you remember those of you that are older when you were young? The hormones, the thoughts, the immaturities, everything's racing. It's colliding with each other. Young people, it's not easy being young. How can a young man cleanse his way, meaning to wash, wash his way? By taking heed according to your word. Verse 10, with my whole heart I have sought you. Your word, verse 11, that I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. But who are we today? Where are we at? Each of us has 
a mirror provided for us by the Holy Spirit. Don't look in a mirror without the Holy Spirit. But just because the false accuser of their brethren will conjure up all sorts of stupid stuff. But allow the Holy Spirit with his conviction to hold that mirror in front of you. Who are you today? Are you delighting in his word? Or are you, as it is written in Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 10, it's written, The word of God has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Is that you today? Let's go on. Verse 17, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Verse 20, my soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all time. Verse 23, but your servant meditates on your statutes and your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. My, verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. 28, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Verse 32, I will run the course of your commandments and you shall enlarge my heart. Verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant. Verse 41, Let your mercies also come to me, O Lord. Verse 42, for I trust in your word. 49, remember your word to your servant, upon which you have caused me to hope. For your word has given me life. 65, O Lord, according to your word, teach me good judgment and knowledge. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But... Now I keep your word. 73. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth to me is better than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Verse 73. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Is that where we are today? Or are we, as Isaiah says in chapter 42, verse 20, you have seen many things, but you do not observe them. Your ears are open, but you don't hear. It's like a parent saying to your children, I see you're hearing me. But I don't think you're listening. You ever experienced that? This is God feeling this. Verse 77. For your law is my delight. 78. But I meditate on your precepts. 81. My soul faints for your salvation. But I hope in your word. My eyes fail from searching your word. Verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. 101, verse 101, I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 107, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. 113. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are a hiding place, my hiding place, and my shield. I hope in your word. 116. Uphold me according to your word that I may live. 123. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. 130, the entrance of your words give light. It gives light, understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. 133, direct my steps by your word. 140, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. 144, give me understanding and I shall live. 147, I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. Your 
my eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Is that your experience? Have you experienced that longing, that involvement in this book? Or are you, as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 50, verse 17, for you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. Where are we at? Again, only look in the Holy in that mirror that the Holy Spirit places in front of you, not the mirror of your own thinking. That doesn't count. It's garbage. Let the Holy Spirit show you where you are, what you are, and who you are in him. Verse 154, revive me according to your word. 160, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your judgments, righteous judgments, endure forever. 161, princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. 169, give me understanding according to your word. Deliver me according to your word. 171, for you teach me your statutes. 172, my tongue shall speak. My tongue shall speak. Of your word, and your law is my delight. In 176, the last verse of the chapter, and it's interesting that he ends this way. The psalmist who's wrote this is so full of the word. What does he say at the end? I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Please seek your servant. Wow. Because when we look into this word that gives life, we are humbled before him. And the closer we get to him in his light, the more needy we see ourselves. It's not about ourselves seeing ourselves as a Gretzky-like player. No, it's we see ourselves as the blind dependent child. But it's the Holy Spirit that works in us. Such a metamorphosis, such a transformation that heaven sees us differently. Heaven exalts the meek and the humbled. Because we don't see ourselves the same way as he sees us. The only thing that we can do, we don't take inventory of ourselves. We don't assess ourselves. We are not qualified. What we do is we immerse ourselves in this book. That's what we do. Jesus says, I am the bread of life, the bread of heaven. He is the water that comes from the rock. And he promises to wash and scrub us with his word to present us a beautiful, lovely bride to to him. This is such a beautiful thing. Do you understand where we're at today? In this place, you're sitting in your seat. Let me read from Deuteronomy and give us some clarity. It is written in chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life, the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to give them on that day when we stand accountable before Jesus, the righteous judge with eyes of flaming fire, looking in and testing our hearts. He wants to give us everything that he is for us to transmit materially all of his glory to everything that exists. That's what he wants for us. But we have to choose life or death. What do we choose today? Do we choose life Because choosing life is not an ambiguous, warm, fuzzy feeling of, yes, I want life. No, choosing life is what you do in the morning when you wake up. Choosing life is how you end your day. 
Choosing life is to have the words printed in us by the Holy Spirit as he opens his word to us. That's choosing life. Or do you choose death? Death is when we let our schedules rule us. Death is when we let our other loves dictate our heart or the fears that we have govern us. Only God's revealed word smashes the idols in our lives. And then, only then, are we free to truly worship him. Do you remember what I read from Hebrews chapter 4? Do you remember that? For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and no creature is hidden. We are open, naked, and bare before the judge who looks into our hearts with eyes of fire and will test our hearts and will answer the question, so what do I do with this heart? Where do I plug him into my economy forever and ever? If through that fire... Nothing survives. Everything that you've built is hay and stubble, burnable. Then he says, come in. You have my name. I have provided all for you. But if by precious stones of his gems and treasures, which he has revealed from this book, he sees those in our hearts. And he goes, oh, ah, well done good and faithful servant. Oh, there's so much I want to give you. You see that? You see the difference? Do you see the part we get to play in this adventure of eternity? We're not passive participants, just receiving and then waiting for heaven. That's not what it's all about. There is a washing required, a scrubbing. There is time in this word Time in this word, time. We all have the same time that we're stewards of. What do we do with it? This is what's so important. Are we looking at eternity as a heavenly dependent? Or are we looking at eternity with great anticipation, great excitement, because our soul life here has been that of a vibrant transmitter of the thoughts and desires of God. Therefore, we know that as we cross the threshold of what we call life and death on this planet, that when we cross that threshold, that we come into eternity exactly in the reality that we've lived our life. If you're a transmitter of his life and heart and desires and his word here and now, you can't transmit what you haven't received, right? So if we're a transmitter here and now, then doesn't it make sense that we go in, that we stand before Jesus as a transmitter of him? He knows us as a transmitter, right? So I looked up this word transmitter and I saw that in the Oxford Dictionary, You know how sometimes they they use a word in a sentence to try to explain the word? Because first of all, it explains transmitter as a a mechanical means of broadcasting a signal, right? A radio signal or something. But it was very interesting, the sentence they used to illustrate the word. Here's the sentence. She wants to do original work, not just be a transmitter of others' ideas. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Isn't that the heart of Satan? As an angel created to minister to the eternal glory of God, he came up with this feeling, pride in himself. And Satan said, I don't, I want to do original work. Look at me. I don't want to be a transmitter of other people's ideas. Do you realize 
if we are Christians that are spectators, atoned by the blood of Jesus, waiting for heaven, do you realize that in our soul life, we go through every day doing our original work? Do you realize that? That's who we are as Christians, waiting for heaven. Or you can take this book and become a vibrant transmitter of the revealed word that God brings into you, makes alive in you. So you're reading this, you're reading this, you're reading this. You're reading this like, like you're drinking water. You're, you're reading this. And everything that you read doesn't always make sense. But you read it, you love it, and you know what happens eventually? Things pop. A word, a sentence. And you need to read this voraciously because Scripture interprets Scripture. So if you read a verse here, you need to know what it says here because it gives life to there. Do you know what I mean? You can't just... Uh, pick little verses that are your pet verses and make them yours and think you're reading the Bible. You can't do that because you don't know where that verse sits in. And the enemy is a deceitful fox and he'll take this word and he'll twist it to come up with all sorts of weird things in your life so that you can continue what you believe is your original life. Living out your original thoughts. Meanwhile, Satan is thrilled because you think it's your original life, but really it's his image that you are portraying. You're being tricked. There's only one way to come into life and to be on that day when we stand accountable to Jesus, being told, hmm, my son, oh, I am well pleased. Have I got a place for you? When Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also, he had a wonderful thing in mind. Wonderful. In Hebrews, sorry, Romans chapter 12, I'll close with this. Chapter, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, originally living out your lives, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. Why would you need to prove what is the good and acceptable will? will of God if you're fully atoned for and you're waiting for heaven. Only one reason why you need to know what is the good and acceptable will of God. And that is because your identity, your function, your mission, your purpose of waking up every day is to be a vibrant transmitter of all that he is. If you don't know by revelation what he is, what are you transmitting? You're transmitting your original self, which is anything but original. So we have today a word from the Lord that we are responsible to because we have heard it. This is not something I feel that we can respond to here and now by coming forward, by raising a hand, by praying, because this is not where the, the point or the valley of decision is. Do you know where the valley in Joel, it talks about a valley of decision where there's multitudes there. You know, you know where that valley of decision is? It's not here right now. It's tonight. When the day is done and you're relaxing, how do you Relax. By default, this book should open as you relax to delight yourself in this book. That's the valley of decision. 
It's when you set your alarm tonight to wake up in the morning and you set your time, you have a, you have a, you need so much time, right? Get up, eat, get dressed, get going, right? How much time do you give? Just enough time to get everything done so you don't get to work. Why not? That's a valley of decision when you set your alarm. Why not set your alarm with more time so that you have time? You wake up. Oh, why did we, you wake up? It may even seem strange at first, okay? Why did I set my alarm at that time? I couldn't sleep for another hour. But then you say, oh, yes, my Bible. You give time. You give time for this book as you pray for the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. And that is your moment of decision. Giving time to this book so that the Holy Spirit gives you original discoveries of his mind and his will and his purpose. And what happens is your own mind is renewed. And as your mind is renewed, what happens? Our soul is transformed into his image, which has the effect on judgment day. When we stand before him, he looks with glowing awe and says, wow, we can be there by his grace By the shed blood of Jesus. And the key. Is this book. It's not enough. To come here. And hear this book talked. About. No. This book. Must become. Our treasured place. Sweeter than honey. More precious than many coins of gold and silver. This needs to be our delight. Your eyes can get tired looking at a computer screen if you do that at work. Does your eyes get tired from reading the word? You could, you sh- we should be reading this Bible so much that our eyes get tired. Right? From cover to cover in between. We can wear out, wear out the pages. Ruin the binding and get another one. Right? This book is to be ours. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we stand before you in a solemn moment because we realize that the day is yet ahead of us and we have not walked through our evening and we have not yet lived tomorrow morning. Father, by your grace, may you so draw us to you that in our twilight moments tonight, you are pulling us into you. May it be so hard not to open this book. May it be an act of resisting you stubbornly, obstinately, if we don't open this book because your Holy Spirit is drawing us into you. Holy Spirit, take us as your church. Take us as a child. Take us as a parent. And draw us into your arms through your word. And may we come together again. Full of exciting adventures of discovery in your word. Full. Overflowing. May what we read Monday morning be a strength and a bubbling over into our work day. That day with our people we work with. May what we read in the night be our meditation as we sleep. Lord, by your word, bring us into a special place in your heart. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom as we read. Thank you, Lord. Amen.